Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here, either uh, physically or virtually. Thank you for joining us for our midweek Bible study. Um, just kind of run through a couple things uh, on our prayer list. Continue to remember Mr. Billy Kevan. I got a report this afternoon that uh, he's been sent home, but he's still just in a lot of pain, and uh, we still need to remember him. Also remember Calvin Dykes. Uh, Brother Calvin is, is uh, just struggling a little bit. Can you all hear me? Is that loud enough? Um, Calvin is just not doing well. He's on hospice care. Continue to remember for uh, all of our uh, relief efforts going on in Louisiana. Uh, we have disaster relief crews over there working tirelessly. Uh, just continue to pray for them for protection and also for opportunities to share the gospel. It's a great, uh, a great ministry to be able to go there and, uh, uh, you know, meet physical needs, but also be able to meet spiritual needs at the same time. Lots of uh, names on our list. We'll have that on our Facebook page later if you're not with us. If you didn't get a copy, if you're here, you can pick one up on the way out. We have them on the info desk. Also, if you're here and you didn't get a copy of the overview of the book of James we did last week, there's a few of those left on the info desk as well. You can grab one of those. So we're going to be in chapter one of James tonight. <clears throat> Let me open us with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right in. And uh, I don't know how far we'll get, but I've got the whole book mapped out. So we'll just go until I get, get tired or you get bored or we get through the chapter, whichever happens first, okay? Let's pray. God, thank you for this night. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together uh, in person and also via our Facebook page. I pray that, God, you would minister through your word tonight. God, you know the needs on this list better than we do, and you know each need specifically and intimately. And Father, I just pray that you would meet them at their point of need, um, minister to them as only you can, uh, give comfort to the families of those who are uh, just really struggling right now. God, we're, we're healing is your will. We pray that you would heal. But most of all, God, we pray that you would get the glory through every situation that we have on our list. God, minister to us now as we study your word. I pray that, God, you would speak, not me, uh, that we would hear from you tonight, that your spirit would move, and we would have a clearer understanding of the book of James when we leave uh, than when we started. God, you were great and greatly to be praised, and we're here to do that tonight. I pray for everything else that's going on on campus tonight, for the Iwana kids. For our youth group, I pray, God, you would minister to them powerfully. Uh, and, God, in every situation, we pray that Jesus would be lifted up and he would draw everyone to himself. And we'll praise you for that in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we did the overview last week, and we kind of talked about this first verse of James 1, but I really think it's important to kind of dive back into it again tonight. So he does this inter introduction or greeting, and he says, James a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. Now, he introduces himself there as a doulos of God and also of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, this is the oldest of Jesus' half-brothers. He would be the, uh, from, from best we can tell, he would probably be the, the first in line behind Jesus as far as age of Mary's sons. Uh, what he uses here is actually the lowest form of a slave. It's, it's a slave born into slavery rather than turned into slave. The, uh, the best way to think about that word doulos is not as a slave as what we see in America. Um, our, our, our terminology for slave in America is actually, if you can imagine this, worse <laughs> than the real terminology for a slave in the ancient Near East. Uh, actually, in the ancient Near East, what we did in America, slave owners and slave traders in America would have been put to death in the, in the New Testament time, uh, in the biblical time even, because that was not how you did it. It wasn't uh, buying and selling people. It was a form of indentured servitude that was actually where somebody could not, uh, if, if somebody became destitute and they just had no means of supporting themselves, they could basically be taken on as a slave by somebody and it was really more of, most of the time, it was more of an agreed upon situation that they came under a slave owner, a master, and they worked for him so that he would put them up and he would take care of them. Let's say he had more land. Think about the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal's father represents God, and yet he had servants. He had uh, bond servants. So sometimes this was actually an act of... Uh, you know, charity to bring somebody in as a bond servant. So, so again, it's 
it's, it's a little bit different than our terminology for slave where somebody's actually being purchased. That's vile and disgusting. It's a blot in the, in the history of our great country. And, uh, and I'm not here trying to make any apologies for them. And I'm actually saying that in the biblical days, those people would have been treated very harshly. So this term, though, is somebody who is an indentured servant, a bond servant, somebody who is under the authority of their master. And so James is saying, I am under the authority of God and my brother. And by saying that and not using the term my brother, but saying the Lord Jesus Christ, he is giving credence to the uh, deity of Christ. And he's not trying to take anything away from that by having some kind of an earthly claim to a blood relation to this man, Jesus. He is basically referring to him not as a human being that was his half brother, but as God himself. And this is a great picture of the transformation that has happened in James, the, the shifting of focus that, have, that has happened in James. Uh, as we read last week, James was a, a non-believer. Jesus' half-brothers were, were in complete disbelief of his claims of Messiahship until the resurrection. Now listen, if you're going to change my mind, if you rise from the dead, that's a pretty good way to change my mind about you. You know, I may not have a high opinion of you, but if you rise from the dead, I'm going to give you another look. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you reconsidering. I'm going to reconsider who you are and what kind of uh, authority you carry. And then he uses this word for Lord, curios. And kurios here is an interesting word because it means Adonai. If you were looking at the, 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 uh, one of the translations you could use for that, and one of those uh, being Adonai means sovereign one or sovereign Lord. So he is, he is again, elevating Jesus to the, to the level of God, the level of deity. So he doesn't assert his familiar relationship at all. And then he, after he does his greeting, he enters into what uh, the Hallman says, trials and maturity. Trials and maturity. That's the, the kind of the paragraph heading of these next uh, 15, 16 verses. And he says this in verses, let's read 2 through 4. He says, consider it a great joy. And I, some of you probably have either King James or New King James. Count it all joy. Uh, he says, consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Uh, now, some of you will remember this. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations. All right? If you really look at the, at the literal translation of that diverse temptations or various trials, you could actually refer to it literally as motley tests. Motley tests. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, that word motley, you think about that as a, as a kind of a uh, hodgepodge, you know, all different sizes and shapes. There's no uh, routine to it. There's no synchronicity to it. It's all different. And then trials, tests, temptations, tribulations, all these different phrases that make us understand that we are going through bad times on this side of heaven. I, I'm always surprised when I see Christians going, hot oh, stuff. Well, man, we can fix this. We got to get this country back, and we got to get this world back. Well, that's great, but that's not what the book says is going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean we just ought to get on the Hell Express and throw our hands up and just ride. I'm not. I'm not saying that we don't have any part and parcel to play in trying to improve the society around us. I, I, instantly, when I thought about that, I thought about Matt Armbruster and Tara and all the work that they've done through Ransom Ministries. Uh, they're trying to improve the society around us by ministering to those who, who have, have really kind of hit rock bottom in many cases. They've had legal troubles. They've had drug problems. They've gone through, uh, you know, some kind of a rehab. They need job skills. Those are things that Christians are called to do. Our food pantry, our clothing ministry, those are things that we're called to try to support and help with wherever we can. So it's not that we're just completely hands off on, well, we can't, it's not going to get any better. We just might as well ride it to the bottom. But what I'm saying is we need to understand that the, the scope that we're looking at, the entirety of the world situation is going to devolve. One of the primary reasons I can assure you of that is that people are in charge of it. You know why you, know why you never find a dictatorship where everybody is just happy and loving life? It's because there's always a human dictator. Can I just share something with you? Heaven is not a democracy. It's not a democratic republic. Heaven is 
a dictatorship. But the difference will be that we will have a benevolent dictator, a holy, righteous, and just dictator. So when God the Father dictates what we're to do and not to do, it will be perfect. Now, anytime you demote <laughs> from a heavenly God, a, a creator God, a loving, just, and holy Father, and you put anybody else in the position of dictator, if they've got flesh on their bones, no matter how good they are today, they will get worse. No matter how good they are, no matter how they may have the best of intentions when they get into power, but they're not going to live up to those intentions if they're made of flesh. You know why? Because we're all filled with this old nasty stuff called pride, arrogance, greed. All those things. We, all of those things are coursing through our DNA because we are part of the fall. And so you're going to have somebody in charge that's eventually going to look out for their own good interest and self-interest and not yours. So this is the same kind of thing we're talking about when we talk about these motley tests and the testing of our faith. That's what this world is here to provide. Because of the fall, this world, the, the, the society we live in, the global economy we live in, all of that is going to be testing and trying those of us of the faith. Those of us who are following Christ are going to be tested by the surroundings that we have because we're going to be surrounded by people of flesh. Now that word testing there can also be translated proofing. So when we're talking about count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or motley tests, those tests, the testing, it, I wrote this in my notes, God brings it about or uses it to show you that you are trustworthy. Now, now there's, there's a difference here between testing and tempting, and I want to make sure we clarify that before we move forward. God tempts no one. We're going to talk about that later. But let me tell you something. God tests everyone. Every Man, woman, boy, and girl on this side of heaven is going to go through a testing, a refining process. If we put our faith in Christ, that does not absolve us from testing. That actually puts us more at the front of the class so the teacher is going to see us testing. And it's not to test us to see if we're going to fail. It's God testing us to show that we're not. If Christ is in us, uh, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory, as Paul refers to it. We are, we've already passed the test. So why do we go through it? Because we have to understand that we have been tested. We've been weighed, measured, and not found wanting when we go through these motley trials, these various trials, these tests that we have to go through. And then it says this, the testing or proofing of our faith produces endurance. Endurance also can be translated there constancy, uh, perseverance, patience, a uh, uh, bearing up. Now, now, now think about that. If we're going to endure, how, how do you find out if a bridge support system is going to endure uh, the trials that, that that girder or that you know piling or whatever? How, how do we tr how do we know that it's going to endure? It's tested. The concrete, the cement, the rebar, the wood, whatever it is, the treated lumber, it's got to be tested to know this can hold up this much weight. Anybody like me, when you get on a, an elevator and you look over and see that number and you start looking at other people in the elevator with you, like, I don't know. <laughs> you know there's been times, I'm not being ugly, but I've been times that I've stayed at the hospital and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and the door, ding, and the door opens and I look in there and go, I'll wait. <laughs> Because I know it's been tested, but I don't want to test it again, okay? So, so that's that testing. And by the way, just for, for just to be, tell the truth and stay in the church, I'm the reason I'm worried about it going over the number. It's not, I'm looking at it going, there's some, there's some people in there like me. I'm going to wait to the next one. I don't want to push our luck. But that testing is what we need. And why? Because testing produces endurance. You know how they test st some of that stuff? They put it under pressure. They put it under pressure. They put it under force. And they go, hey, it held up. That means it'll hold up again. That means this same uh, formulation of concrete, that means this same thickness of, of metal, of, of uh, rebar, will hold up to this much weight before it bows, before it breaks. That's the kind of endurance that we find out we have when we've been through testing. Would anybody here just, if you're at home, you raise your hand and people might be looking. If you're listening with your earbuds in, in Starbucks or something, they may think you're crazy. But if you would, if, if you can honestly say that you can relate to this, 
that testing in your life that you know for a fact because of what you've been through in your life that you are more confident in your endurance today than you would have been a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Raise your hand. Because of what you've been through, right? Now think about this. Think about this. None of us would voluntarily want to say, hey, God, I tell you what, uh, I want to I wanna outlive my husband. I want to outlive my wife. I want to outlive my child. Hey, God, I want to have parents that pass away. I want to go through the death of grandparents. I want to go through job loss. I want to go through miscarriages. I want to go through uh, financial hardships. I want to go through COVID-19. Where does that line start? But because we've gone through some of those things, God has shown himself to us in ways that we would have never seen him if we hadn't gone through those. Can I just tell you from my personal experience, me and April have talked about this multiple times. We, we, just, we just celebrated 20 years a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, 20 years of marriage. And we were talking one night down there like, can, would you have guessed that in 20 years we would have gone through this much? I mean, we've got, we've, listen, I know I'm, we're not alone. We're not, I'm not, this is not a pity party. But we, we just sat there and thought about all the things that we've been through. Job changes, career changes, moves, building a house, selling a house, uh, death of family members, losing of loved ones, uh, miscarriage, just all these things we've gone through. But you know how faithful God is? Every time we've gone through something like that, we've had an opportunity to minister to somebody because of what we've gone through. Well, you just don't understand because you've never gone through X. Well... Now that you mention it, I have. Yeah, but you just don't know how it feels to lose. Well, yeah, we do. And that's not saying that we know every situation, but I'm telling you, all God is faithful. He has put people in our path multiple times that probably wouldn't have listened to us five years earlier when we hadn't gone through some of that. But because we had been tested, watch, and because we had our endurance had been proven and been developed, now we had a standing with this person so that we could minister, we could share the gospel, we could just be a sounding board. That would not have happened without those trials. So you know what I say? Glory to God for the trials. Now again, I'm just telling you right now, I, God, if you're listening, and I know you are, I will put my name on the list for no more trials until I die. At a ripe old age. I always tell people, I want to die in my sleep, nice and peacefully, like my granddaddy, not screaming and yelling like all those people in the car with him. Right. <laughs> but I'll put my name on that list right now. God's got a sign-up sheet for no more misery my whole life. But can I just tell you, I, I know that's probably not the case. If that list exists, I don't know where it is. And to be honest with you, I couldn't sign it if I'm being prayerful about it. Because prayerfully speaking, I read this verse and I say, that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then watch the next part in verse 4. But endurance must do its complete work. Complete. So that you may be, watch this, complete. If endurance has to do its complete work in order that I be mature and complete, in other words, for complete is holy... The Bible says be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. That means be complete, mature, total in all of your humanity, just as totally submitted to Him as you can be, as perfected in Him as you can be and still wear this flesh. If that's my goal, and listen to me, it is, then I can't sign up for no more trials. I can't sign up for no more hardships because I understand this Scripture is true that the testing of my faith produces endurance and endurance must do its complete work so that I may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Only through the complete work of enduring trials can we see mature and complete believers emerge on the other side. It's like a sausage grinder. Anybody like sausage? Anybody ever seen it made? Probably not. Not if you still like it. Probably not. <laughs> so that's the same thing. Listen, I love me some Connecticut sausage. I love me some Kelly sausage. But I don't want to go sign up for the tour of the plant where they slaughter the hogs and they put all the stuff in there. Hey, I'll just stand out here on the outside and when y'all get it all cooked up, cleaned up, wrapped up, I'm your guy. Matter of fact, if y'all will go ahead and slap it on the grill and put a little barbecue sauce on it, I'm really your guy. But that's what it is with endurance, and that's what it is with testing. It's like the sausage being made. 
if you're going to get to be some of that good old link sausage, you've got to go through the grinder. Now, maybe not, that's probably the worst analogy I've ever had pop in my head. But y'all listen, I had a salad for supper. I'm starving already. But, but that's what it is. Now, now watch this. April, April I'm going to give April credit. She sent this to me today, and it's so good. I'm going to read you some passages out of the Amplified Bible, okay? This is how good God is. April was, April's working on Hebrews 2 today, and I was finishing up James 1 today, and I was almost to the end, and I had to go back and look at this when she texted this to me. Hebrews 2.10, out of the Amplified Version, those of you don't, that don't use it, it is really a useful study tool if you have it, because it gives you, and it's hard to read sometimes because it gives you a lot more words, but it really gives you clarity sometimes on what it's saying. So this is Hebrews 2.10 out of the Amplified Bible. For it was fitting for God, that is an act worthy of His divine nature, that He, for whose sake are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the author and founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And then it's got a bracket, bringing to maturity the human ex experience necessary for him to be perfectly equipped for his office at high priest. Let me read that again, that last part. That he should make the author and founder of their salvation perfect. He's talking about Jesus. That he should make Jesus perfect through suffering. Now listen, that, that definition of that is, is how the Amplified defines it, is bringing to maturity the human experience necessary for him, Jesus, to be perfectly equipped for his office as high priest. Now let me go back to James 1. But endurance must do its complete work. Back to verse 3. Testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, April said this. Jesus was perfected through suffering. His suffering qualified him. And we are perfected through our suffering. Now think about that relationship now that we have with understanding Jesus. Can I just tell you, I understand Jesus better the more I suffer. I, I, I honor Jesus and his earthly sacrifice more the more I suffer. I don't like it. I'm not here to tell you that I am just fired up about going out to suffer. I'm not going, Lord, strike me with some dreaded disease. Give me. But I've said this a million times and I'll say it until I drop dead. If I don't want cancer. I've seen what it does to people. My mom is a cancer survivor. April's mom uh, was a cancer survivor and eventually succumbed to the disease. Her dad died from a, from a cancer. Listen, it's not pleasant. I don't like it. It's, it's despicable. But I want you to hear me. If it is God's perfect will for me to have cancer, then cancer I won't. You, you understand me? And I'm not saying that flippantly, y'all. I'm, I'm way too old to say things flippantly. I've, I've got enough mileage on me not to be stupid. But I'm just telling you, if it is in God's perfect plan for me to get cancer, and that's the best way I can bring him glory, then bring it on. Because Job would not have asked for God to take his family. Job would not have asked for God to take his material. Job would not have asked for God to take his wealth. Job would not have asked for God to take his health. But watch what I tell you when I tell you that Job knew God's faithfulness better than most of us. Because of his what? Suffering. Then look at Hebrews 12 2. You know, this is the first one. Hebrews 12 1. We are, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, right? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that it so easily ensnares. Now listen to Hebrews 12, 2. Looking away from all that, this is again out of the Amplified. Looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, the first incentive for our belief, and the one who brings our faith to maturity, who, for the joy of accomplishing the goals set before him, endured, there's that word again, y'all, endured the cross disregarding the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. I love the way the, the Amplified reads there. And this is, this is what April sent me in the text message after that. Why would I ever think that I shouldn't endure suffering? Hebrews 12, 2 shows us the attitude we should have when enduring suffering, and that is the attitude of Christ, the perfecter of our faith. Now let me read James 1, verses 2 through 4 in the Amplified. Now, and I want you to listen for these words. Uh, testing and trials and joy and, and, and enduring, okay? 
Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. Isn't that beautiful? To think about what James is saying in James 1 and what the author of Hebrews is saying not once but twice in, in uh, chapter 2 and, and chapter 12. That he's tied all of these thoughts together and all of these thoughts are swirling around the concept of enduring suffering. Steady yourself and leaning into the wind and the waves and the rain and, and whatever else life is going to throw at you. Because listen... When it comes to trials, it is always a matter of when rather than a matter of if they come. And, and I wrote this, I thought this was really good. Dr. Tony Evans said it this way. A trial is a divinely ordained difficulty that God causes or permits so that he may grow us and conform us into the image of his son. Romans 8, 28, 29. And then he says this, Christians in crisis are actually undergoing extreme makeovers. Christians in crisis are actually undergoing extreme makeovers. Can anybody just relate to that a little bit this evening? Can any of you at home relate to that? Are you are you experiencing a trial right now? Would you could you really say that you are a Christian in crisis right now? Then guess what? I've got good news. Have you seen the show Extreme Makeover? I haven't. I know what it is, but I'm not, that's not my jam is HGTV. I'm just, I, that bores me to death. I built a doghouse one time. The dog wouldn't sleep in. I'm not handy. I don't watch HGTV because they just make, well, here's what I figured out. If you put thin wood, thin white wood boards on something, all of a sudden it's like $100,000 more. <laughs> but here's what I know about Extreme Makeover. You go watch every episode, I dare you. And find one episode where the people at the end of the makeover aren't ecstatic. I mean like losing their rabid mind ecstatic. They, have y'all seen some? I've watched just a little clip or two of it. And they, they like open their eyes and they go nuts. I mean it's like a three year old when Santa Claus shows up. They go crazy. They're screaming and yelling and jumping around and hugging. Listen, can you imagine the response of a Christian that's in crisis, that's undergoing testing, that knows that endurance is going to be the result, that knows that their faith is going to be made whole, that their lives are going to be made more complete because of the suffering that they're enduring on behalf of the Savior of the world? Can you imagine how much more excited we ought to be knowing that we're going to experience that extreme makeover, knowing that we're going to see on the other side something that we never could have fathomed could have existed before? We should be ten times, a hundred times more excited than somebody getting a new house. Yeah. We should be ecstatic when we go through trials. Dr. Jerry Spencer uh, was the pastor at, Reho uh, at Ridgecrest Baptist Church, and he was preaching a revival service at Southside one night, and he told this story. He said there was a, and I don't remember all the details, so Brother Jerry, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to mess your story up. But he was talking about being in a, in a foreign country, and they had just come out from under a really... Uh, severe dictatorship and, and they were starting to have some freedoms and one of the guys that was their translator their guide was talking to them and he said when they went in there the guy got emotional he said what is it he said the last time i was here they had like 10 uh people naked chained up and they brought them up on this platform this stage in front of everybody and all these guards with these ak-47s were up there and they started had them all chained up and they got to the one on the first end and they told him to deny his faith in christ or they were going to kill him and he wouldn't do it. And he actually started singing or praising or something. And they shot him and killed him. And the next guy in line, they went to him and said, Now you, you deny your faith. You deny this Jesus. And he started just saying, like repeating scripture or praying or something. And they shot him. And he said the most amazing thing happened. Y'all will be don't miss this. The people on the opposite end, the people who were on the other end of the line where they were working their way down, they started shouting and singing and praising God. They were so excited that God had counted them worthy to die for the name of Jesus. That's having the right mindset that James wants us to get, that we need to be complete. And if we're going to be complete, then endurance has to complete its work. You see, God is at work in us producing endurance 
So we need to let him do his work and let his work make a change in us. Can I just, I'm looking around this room tonight and I'm sure we have some very godly people dialed in tonight watching. But I'm just looking around here and I see some heroes of mine. Some people who have been walking their faith out longer than I've been alive. Well, listen to me. Well, can I tell you this? You know, where, you know what we all have in common? You've heard me say it before. The ground is always perfectly level at the foot of the cross. There's no high ground at the foot of the cross. Every one of us needs to let God make a change in us. No matter how far along we are. Now listen, my change is probably a little bit bigger than yours. He's going, God's going to have to get his working gloves on with me a little bit more than he is with you. You may be just one of those where he just puts a screwdriver in and takes one little tweak to get it right. And me, he has to tear the thing down and go order parts. But wherever we are in our Christian walk, God needs to do a work in us. Our prayer shouldn't just be that God would end a trial for us, but that he would teach us all that we need to know in that trial. And let's say that again because that's good. Our prayer shouldn't just be that God would end a trial for us, but that he would teach us all that we need to know in that trial. I think I said that several several weeks ago now when we were first in kind of the throes of the COVID-19 crisis. We can pray for God to end this virus, and I do, but I want you to hear me. We should not pray that he ends it before we figure out what he's trying to teach us through it. C.S. Lewis said, pain and suffering is God's megaphone to a sleeping world. If this isn't pain and suffering enough for you to say, God, why do you want to teach me? God, why do you want me to change? God, why do you want me to do? God, why would you have me to say and to be? Then I don't know what you're waiting for. There are people who are jobless, homeless. There are people who don't know how they're going to feed their kids. There are people who are, uh, are, are, are on the verge of dying right now because of this virus. Listen to me. This is a global pandemic, and we need to understand that God is trying to get our attention when we go through these things. And so we would be foolish. Listen to me, church. Listen to me at home. We would be foolish to go through all of this suffering and walk out the other side going, Well, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> and not walk out the other side going, Man, God is so good. Woo, glory to God. He taught me so much through the last nine months, through the last two years, whatever you've gone through. It would be a shame for you to go through suffering and be stupid enough to walk out the other side the same way you walked in. If you're not going to learn through suffering, I want you to hear me, you're going to keep suffering. You're going to suffer twice. You're going to suffer whatever that trial is, and then you're going to suffer whatever it is that you could have overcome if you had just learned from the first one. Pay attention when you're suffering. Pay attention when you're going through trials and tribulations because God is trying to teach you. He's trying to work a, a, a miracle in you to change you more to the image of His Son, Jesus. I will say this. It is perfectly okay to pray that God would make you a quick study. I always say that about patience. I, I got the opportunity last Thursday night to spend a little quality time with Henry Cooper. Austin was teaching in here, Hillary was teaching in there, and Coop got to a point where he just didn't care. <laughs> he watched all the videos on his phone. He was like, he looked at me like, I ain't watching more videos, I'm gonna go get into something. And so I just got I was sitting in the back, I just eased up, went on in the one of the rooms in there with him and let him play with stuff. And here's what I learned. Here's what I learned. I am not ready to be a grandfather. <laughs> I see, I see some of these old roughneck guys like me, and I see the little hearts melt when they become a granddaddy. Not there yet. <laughs> Got a little work to do. Got to get there. I love Cooper, but I was like, buddy, I, I'm so tired right now. Just, just yeah, I, yeah, car. Got it. You know, so, so here's what I want to tell you. When I pray for patience, I don't pray God would teach me patience. You know why? I'm uh, 48. I ain't stupid. I want God to teach me patience. You know, how, you know how painful it is when God teaches you patience? He taught Job patience. No, thank you. Lord, give me patience. But can I just tell you? All kidding aside, it don't work God teaches us through trials. He teaches us through pain. He teaches us through suffering. Here's another good Tony Evans quote. He said, God applies the iron of trials to the wrinkles of our lives so that Jesus Christ looks good wearing us. Let me repeat that one too. God applies the iron of trials 
to the wrinkles of our lives so that Jesus Christ looks good wearing this. And then verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, uh, pause. That's kind of a tongue-in-cheek statement. Y'all all get that? James is kind of being funny a little bit. Y'all see that? How many of y'all in here lack wisdom? All of us. Amen. Some, some of us are lacking a little bit more than others, but we're all lacking wisdom. Why? Because we're going to ask God for it. Let me tell you something. He ain't lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. Part of being a fast learner is gaining wisdom as quickly as possible, and wisdom only really comes from God. That's it. God is the only giver of true wisdom, of good wisdom, of godly wisdom, of perfect, pure wisdom. The Amplified Bible translates this, this verse this way. If any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he says to ask our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. Any, all right, I'm going to pick on Grace. Actually, I'm going to pick on Byron. Grace, did you ever ask your dad something and then you immediately regretted asking? <laughs> So I had a teacher. The re I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go with that. I'm just going to say I had a teacher one time, and I asked a question, and she would say, are you stupid? And I was like, well, I'm not stupid enough to keep asking you questions. So I just sat there and made a bad grade in class, and that makes me stupid. I know, I know. But you ever have that person that you ask for help or you ask for advice, and they, they ridicule you, they belittle you? Oh, I don't know that. Good gracious. Well, yeah, I'll help you. I want you to hear me. That's not how God is when we ask for wisdom. You know why? Everybody get this. is deep. He made us. He knows. He knows the next thing you're going to think before you can think it. He knows what you're going to I love the little meme that says, when you tell God you'll never do that again, but God knows what you're going to do on July 31st of 2025. And it's got this kid making this face. That's it. He knows what you're going to do. He knows all it. He, he's the only one who knows the end from the beginning. So when you ask for wisdom, he's like, good. He's like, here, let you need it. <laughs> if, he's, if you're like me and you're bumping into stuff all the time and God's looking at you going, I, I've got a flashlight if you'll just ask me for it. Mm. If you're getting lost all the time and you find wind up in a ditch and you're picking briars out of your leg and God's going, I've got a out. Hello. Why don't you ask me? I'll guide you. I'll tell you where to go. If you ask for wisdom from God, He will give generously without rebuke or correction. He's not going to belittle you for asking for something that He knows you need. You know why? Because He's a good God. He's a loving Father. We can't move from here without acknowledging what a monumental if James puts in here. If you lack wisdom, we all lack it or we wouldn't be in the messes we find ourselves in because of our inability to allow the Spirit to lead or our inability to overcome our own flesh. Let's try to get through 6 and 7, maybe 8, and then we'll finish. Verse 6, But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man, or, or the King James says a double-minded man, is unstable in all his ways. So here, here's how to ask for wisdom and how to deal with doubt. That's what these 6 and 7 deal with. However, when we ask, we have to ask in complete faith without any doubting. <laughs> Did anybody else think, uh-oh, when I read that? That's what he's saying here. Ask in faith without doubting. There's our primary problem with getting wisdom is we, we struggle to ask in faith without doubting. Sometimes we doubt God. Sometimes we doubt our own abilities. Sometimes we doubt just life in general. We just have an Eeyore attitude. You know, how you doing? Probably going to die. You ever have those people? You ever have a, you know, don't, don't raise them. We, we, we start telling names in here, put them on the prayer list. You see, God communicates wisdom through His Word and through godly people who are put there to help us understand how to live for Christ. Only someone living for Christ can help you know how to do the same. You don't want to get cooking lessons from somebody who can't cook. You don't want to get, listen, I, I can't teach you how to play golf. I can't teach you how not to play golf. Now, I can teach you how to fish. I can't teach you how to dunk a basketball. You see what I'm saying? You need to go to somebody who knows what they're doing. Any analogy of a doubter 
Like what we see here, he says it here like the surf tossed by the wind. Any analogy of a doubter is going to show you something confused or disorganized or discombobulated. Why? Because that's what a doubter looks like. That's what a doubter is. A doubter is by nature disorganized, discombobulated. Why? Because they're doubting. Y'all, y'all, we'll do this. Do y'all know some people who just doubt the very, like, they, they're scared to put one foot in front of the other? They just, they're so scared, tentative. Uh, you know, I think all of us can, can get that way in sometimes certain situations. We get that way because life stresses us and we, we maybe we've made some mistakes and we're afraid we're going to step off on that same mistake again. But listen, when we doubt, it's okay to doubt you, but listen, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're doubting Him. If you're, if you're a follower of Christ, if you've committed your life and surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus, you're doubting Him. You're doubting God's ability. Now, that, now we've got a problem. And that's why He says it's like a wind tossed by the waves and tossed by the, the, the sea, tossed by the wind and waves. You ever seen a wave crash and the wind's blowing? It just blows little pieces of foam and white and the water's like, it's just... It doesn't even look cool when it comes over like one big piece. That's us. We're thrown around by the tides. We're thrown around by the wind. We're thrown around by the waves. Rolling in many directions and being blown apart at the top. Completely unstable and very dangerous. That's, that's what we do when we live a life that's just completely full of doubt. And then verse 8 kind of ties it in a bow there. Where it's talking about an indecisive or double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That word double-minded is actually two Greek words put together. Dipsukos. Dis meaning twice or again. And suke, which means soul or spirit. And what he's saying here is it's, it's a double-spirited person. Or a vacillating person. A wishy-washy person. A person who won't just, watch me, a person who won't just commit to their Sunday school. Commit to their calling. Commit to their church. Commit to their family. Commit to their spouse. Double-minded people are always going to be in trouble. They're either in trouble or about to be in trouble or just came out of trouble because they're double-minded. They're not focused. They're not singular in their goal of loving Jesus and loving others. They're not like we talked about with Paul. He has made it his goal to know Christ. That's a single goal, and that's how a single-minded person can be. And if your single-minded goal is to love Jesus, to know Jesus then everything else is going to fix itself. Everything else is going to work out. But if you're double-minded, you're thinking, well, maybe I should get over here and, and, and maybe I should take this job. No, maybe I should take this other job. Maybe I should buy, Maybe I should do this. And then you end up doing nothing. You end up just, just vacillating, vacillating back and forth. And then the word ways, that means conduct, lifestyle, or way of life. So he's double-spirited in his whole lifestyle. If he's not, and what he's saying is just not being committed to the mission that God has put him on without doubting. Basically, what he's saying is indecisive people are following an uncertain path. The person without a heavenly, a heavenly focus speaks from ignorance and has a flimsy foundation for all of their decisions. I'll say that one more time. The person without a heavenly focus speaks from ignorance. And has a flimsy foundation for their decisions. That's what it means to be double-minded. That's what it means to not ask for wisdom. Look, look, that's what it means not to have endurance because you're not willing to go through trials. See, all of these things that, that, that James is talking about here is telling us he's leading us somewhere. We count it all joy when we have trials because trials test our faith and our faith gets tested and produces endurance. And endurance must complete its work so that we're mature and complete. And if we don't have wisdom, we should ask God because He's going to give it to us. But we've got to ask without doubting. We've got to have faith. Because if we doubt, we're like a wave tossed around by the wind. And that person shouldn't expect to receive anything. Because that person is double-minded. And we should not be known as people who are double-minded. We should be known as people who are singularly focused on bringing fame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So next week, we're going to pick up in verse 9. We got through eight verses. Don't, don't panic. <laughs> but next week, we're going to pick up in verse 9 in James 1. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you for your patience, uh, your faithfulness. Please uh, look on our, on our Facebook page later in our group. We're going to put our uh, prayer list out there. Uh, again, I'm going to apologize for our PDF problems. We can't figure that out. We've, we've got our best people on it. 
and for some reason it's 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 got gremlins in it we, we can't decide so we're trying to work on a solution just be patient with us and as soon as we can we'll get that up so you can download it and be able to uh, pray through all these needs okay let's let's pray father thank you for your love and your grace thank you for your mercy and your patience god i thank you that you are a benevolent dictator who only has what's best for us in mind god i thank you that you don't just give us what we want you give us what we need and you know our needs more than anybody. And God, I pray that you would continue to meet our needs according to your riches and glory and help us to be faithful to that. Help us to be single-minded, not double-minded. Help us to be faithful, not faithless. And God, help us to come to you and ask for that wisdom that only you can provide. Thank you for this time in your word, God. I pray you bless it for Jesus' glory and in his name. Amen. God bless you.